we are working on a certain project at JPL, which is rightly open source on GitHub in the sense that, yes, the code exists. But the whole process of get, getting or onboarding a new person onto this project is what we were discussing. And I had some previous like short experience with working with other Apache projects and open source projects outside. Which is why she invited me to have a discussion on how to bring your project to open source. So just for the audience, how many of you guys are actively engaging in open source development? And are you guys members of any foundations? So some things on this presentation might ring the bell with you. And more than a talk, I want this to be a discussion where we can engage and take some points back to even JPL and implement them because it's not like one size fits all. So it's like an open source software, this should be an open source talk, I would say. So that's again, how to bring your project to open source. Well, it could be a good for the repair cafe because you didn't have a link to your software that you want to write. Well, so, what am I going to be covering? First, what is open source? Probably most of you know what it is, which is why I just put a formal sort of definition and then we move on to what's the value to be open source and how would you get there to be open source. So, before that, so uh, people out here, how many are working on like proprietary software and in company? Okay. So, Hopefully, by the end of this talk, I can convince you guys to start putting all your software open source and just have components that are closed. So, some things about me. Uh, my name is Sujan. I've been a member of the Apache Software Foundation for about two and a half years now. I got involved with Apache Nutch uh, starting out in my grad school and then into ODT when I moved on to uh, JPL. I've been involved with other non-Apache projects, uh, which have been part of JPL and DARPA uh, funding, funded programs from USC and now working at JPL. Well, so as I said, I we have our code on GitHub. What is it? Open source. But is it really? Let's see. This is sort of the formal definition that open source initiative have put on. Like, if you read on their website, you can really know that this has been put forward by a lawyer and not by the like, software people. Because this probably takes in only the legal aspects of being open source. It's like, okay, your, your distribution has to be free. It has to include the source code. Just binaries are not enough because, yes, you need open source. Redistribution should be allowed. There should be no discrimination. You should protect the integrity of the author and more down the line. And all of that would depend on what kind of license would you choose. Well, we have that out of the way. Let's understand why should we go to open source. Well, one of the biggest reasons, or like a couple of them, the value of being open source. So all those folks who are still trying to work on their closed source software, the value to go is firstly, you have control on your software. You are not locked in with any vendor. You can take it, modify it, implement it, even implement it in a way that it wasn't even originally designed for. That's some flexibility that you get. For training, this is something from my personal experience when I started as a student. Like going onto the Apache Nut website and getting all the resources and my first pull request and getting reviewed from people like in Germany, like the chair is in Germany and the other folks in UK, just helped me become a better software developer and follow the process. So training is one of the biggest benefits for your new workforce of having open source. The second probably would be stability. Just the fact that the same software has been reused and imagine if that's been used commercially and a lot of companies rely on it naturally the project will become stable due to its configuration. Well, the one thing that everyone thinks about, which could be a double-edged sword, is probably security. Right? You may have heard this law, which is give, given in a high box, all bugs are shut. Which means you have a large base 
of contributors who look through our source code, bugs are found quickly and fixed. So this is something which is a benefit. Well, you could argue either way, but I consider it to be a benefit. Some of the other benefits that are not really that major is like you would share the burden of the actual maintenance of your software. It's, and then you would have a better quality code because imagine if I am only the creator and I, I'm working on some software which I know no one else is going to be reading, I'll be like, okay, I don't need comments. Well, do I need good variable names? Maybe not. Who's looking at issues? I'll just go in and commit whatever I want. What's my commit? Update typo, update typo, and I have like 100 comments with saying update typo. Well, that's not really sustainable. Uh, two years down the line, you read at your code, you're scratching, and then you just re-implement all of it. And that's happened probably more than once to a lot of people here. Well, the other thing which uh, we see beneficial, at least to JBL, is it sort of eliminates the legal troubles when you have to collaborate with external parties, saying that if your project is open source, Hey, just go on. We don't have any intellectual rights. You can you can look at it. We have a tactical license, and contractors can work on it pretty easily without having to be bogged down by a lot of bureaucratic process. Well, one thing I noticed like a couple of weeks back while working with uh, uh, another JPLer, hey, we both were developing the same thing, and none of us knew that we were working on. It. Why? Because well, the teams are siloed. Well. He sits up the hill, and I'm down the hill. I never even walk up that far. And how would I know? A simple Google search also does not give a solution. Why? Because both of us are working on internal repositories. Even though none of it is, say, legally intellectual property, just the tool I was writing to render tables more beautifully on React. Come on. <laughs> so it's like, that's one advantage of mine. Well, you may say that I tried to go open source but I found a lot of challenges, which I don't deny. There are some challenges. Coming from an organization like JPL, some challenges that we face are mainly export control is one of the biggest ones, and the ITAR protection on our software. So we need to make sure that's not there. Some other companies may have intellectual property rights. Also, coming down, if you're using some dependencies that have certain license restrictions, that would flow through in a code which you want to take care of. Now, one important thing, which is an appropriate governance model. Maybe from what we heard uh, with happening with Linus is like, do we need a proper <coughs> governance model so that one person doesn't rule all, maybe? So we'll talk about the governance model going forward. The other thing is, yes, as an original creator of one of the softwares, there is a lot of effort required initially to push it to open source, to push it to make it adaptable for people who have never really known what you're doing and just need to use it out of the box. Your tools need to be packaged. It should not be that only you know how to install your software and only you know how to run it because your bash command does not have arguments. You just go for it however you want to develop. That's the other thing. One more thing would be Every organization, once they push a project open source, you need to identify key individuals. Individuals who, yes, know how the code works and how the software works, and also can maintain it going forward and are good with communication outside with the community. The other important thing which comes from a non-developer perspective is to establish good support channels, which is when users come in, uh, and also remember, users of your software are a part of your community, even though they do not contribute. Just the fact that they are installing and running and reporting feature requests and bug make them a part of your community. You need to provide them an efficient way to, to have communication back to the maintainers, which is why we need good support channels. We'll be talking more about that going on. And then, well, this is something very subjective, which is strong personal beliefs. It can happen over time in projects when people become veterans. They might have certain beliefs that we need to overcome as a community, which is why going back to the governance model, if you adopt it right, we can uh, avoid the one-person rule all. 
uh, ideology. Let's see. So the things that we are going to cover and uh, address the challenges is understanding how we go to open source. Now the first thing people would know is you need to choose a license. Now, I personally have experience only with the Apache license, and most of the work we do, we put it under Apache because that's probably one of the most progressive licenses that I've found. And being a member of the Apache Software Foundation, I have a slight bias to release stuff under Apache. But there are no licenses. You could use a copy left license if you really want to have uh, the code be with that same license going down and still allow modifications. Or if you really want to be free and open. I, I was reading uh, while putting this slide that MIT license has been one of the most popular permissive licenses uh, in the past few years. But that, that's a choice that one can make. But choosing a license is really important to even put your code in the open. The governance model. Now, coming back to why is it really important? Well, you need to define your roles and responsibilities of people who are in the project. Or else, when you have comments, when you have issues, you just wait and be like, hey, it's not my job to do it. It's someone else's job. You need to provide a roadmap for your users as to when is the next release coming? What are the new features coming out? If you don't provide that, users will not be inclined and adapting your software. Which, then the other thing is, yes, you have debates. You have a community. Community might have debates. They will have some views. You need a way to resolve that. Again, going back to why we need a governance model. You need quality control of your software. You need CI, you need CDs, you need uploading standards. All of that would be defined in the governance document that you would come up with. Let me just take you towards uh, what I have been experiencing, which is like, the Apache way of governance. It, I, I know that Mike starts is involved with it, but if, you, if other people are not, well, they believe in merit, which is those who do the work have the same. If you don't do any work, you cannot say, or you won't have voting rights, basically, deciding on when a release would happen or what feature gets in or not. Then consensus. Well, it's all built around the community model. Every committer on the project has an equal weighted vote. And the chair cannot move forward if they don't have enough votes for anything. Which, which is why consensus, if you read the documents when going to Apache, you would have to establish this consensus and prove to the board as to you follow this process before doing a release. Community. Well, yes, you can have collaboration, and that, that can be asynchronous by email, issues per request. They are geographically distributed around, and you don't, you don't, you're not working like a team inside a single company. You need to be accepted and acceptable of everyone else. And charity, like one of the points of charity where they say Apache would never pay any developer to maintain a software, and all the software that comes out would be free. But you do need a certain commercial support for open source softwares to really uh, sustain themselves. And the way a lot of companies do it by providing services around the core software, which is already open source. Some of the rules that they define are probably a user. So from my experience, uh, having this governance, mo governance model in place for Apache Nudge guided me to, hey, this is the way I need to contribute. I started as a user, I downloaded it, and I just used the software. Perfect. I could scrape a website or multiple websites and build my own system. Great. Now, I found that hey, I need to direct my caller in a certain manner. I had some ideas. I put an issue request. I got a response from one of the maintainers. Hey, why not you want to do this? And he mentored me. Then I became a developer by submitting a pull request. It got merged in, and then I suggested more fixes because I was more familiar with the code and more comfortable changing it. I got invited to become a committer. Then I had right access. I saw myself mentoring other people onto the project, which is when I got invited to become a member of the project management committee. This is where your vote becomes equally weighted with everyone else. Having this in place helped me get into this project much easily 
than not having any direction as to where should my contributions go. So it is really important when you go open source, you should have a governance model in place. Maybe not this one, but something that directs your contributors in the direction. And if you notice, these, uh, the user and the project management committee does not really depend on the user being a programmer. Even non-programmers are a part of the community. They can become a project, uh, they can become members of the PMC. It's just how much involved you are and how much time you can contribute. Okay. This is just going more in detail about individual roles. Well, user is someone who gets uses the software, submits pull requests, or maybe uh, bug fixes, reports, and feature requests that helps you improve your software. The developer is when maybe a user who gets comfortable be like, hey, you know what? This, this particular software has helped me a lot in reducing my work. Let me contribute back to it. And then submit some bug fixes or features that he wants or she wants. Then we go to committers who then get right access, which we discussed. And then you have a project manager. The critical role of the project manager is to make sure that the project stays on track and aligned with its goals and make sure that all decisions are in consensus with everything. No one person is trying to outweigh the direction in which the project is headed. And if you join a foundation like the Apache Software Foundation, the manager is responsible as the interface between the board and the project and keeping the project as a top level of project. And then you have the committee that does the voting, the resolution of debates, and all of that. Well, the next thing is like, one of the most important things, in my opinion, which users interface first with, are the support channels. The support channels is to have sustainability in the software. One of my experiences with <coughs> working with this project at JPL was there was, unless I knew them personally, if I were outside JPL, it was really difficult to get any support because there was none set up. It was just for, after the to go, bang my head, too much time to spend. Well, these support channels are not only limited to like your issue tracking machines or like Jira software, but also your how to's. Like, how do I? Most of the users of many of the bugs uh, that come in are usually solved amongst the users itself if you have a good FAQ. That's one of the important things in a support channel. Yes, you would have a code repository online, issue tracking, documentation, and other modes of communication, which we'll talk about ahead. Go to uh, a code repository. How many of you here use GitHub? Okay. Uh, how many use GitLab or have heard of GitLab? Okay, so that represents a good percentage of the numbers that I see when I was, I was doing my research. Well, I personally like GitLab now that I've started using it, uh, but the point of this is to have your code somewhere in the open source where uh, the users can submit pull requests and issues again, because that's really important. GitLab, is, to make a case for GitLab, if people haven't used it, it comes with an integrated uh, CI CD, which is like continuation, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment which in GitHub you might have a Jenkins attached or a Travis CI or a Circle CI which you have a third party. Apart from just having this inbuilt in the software with the tools that you can see on GitLab, they also provide a Docker registry in case people here are working with Dockers. And when you're hosting your own instance, I've found GitLab to be really useful where everything is provided out of the box versus trying to set up a GitHub and other individual components. Well, documentation. This probably, everyone has ever at least read it uh, in the sense that you know and appreciate good software documentation when what you read actually is what happens. Most of the times, that's the case. Some software that we might develop and put it, maybe not. It is really important to have that working if you're trying to attract and build a community. There are many tools out there. Like if people are not aware, Atlassian 
provides free uh, Confluence and Jira instances if you apply for their open source license. So that's something you should make use of, and that's something I've been using uh, pretty much regularly now. And there are other automated doc generation tools which people might be aware of. <coughs> issue tracking, yes, you need to, you can have a flood of issues if you don't have a way to track them, triage them, label them. So one way is to use the inbuilt uh, issue tracking mechanism coming with your uh, versioning system, which could be GitHub or GitLab. Or you could have a third party, which is a Jira, which tries to link to your GitHub, GitLab, and then do the issue tracking for you. Some companies that I've noticed, like Ansible, I guess, they use, uh, they have bots that have probably responded to all the issues by analyzing the text in the issue, and then what they do is basically tag it and have appropriate ad mentions to the developer. So people who are really uh, working on that part of the software are engaged instantly. You could have bots. There are bots available open source. Just attach them to, to your system. The other advantage that I found uh, of at least GitHub issues when you search for something on Google is many of, many of the times your issues are resolved user to user. It's like, hey, this guy is facing a problem. Someone has commented on it. Well, it resolves my issue. I don't need to open one again. Also, those issue tracking softwares can be used as an official response from the maintaining party of that software. Because you could have other sources like Stack Overflow or Reddit channels where people talk about their software if it's that popular. And then they don't know if this is the official response or this is just someone who has used the software and can read code. Well, an issue tracking system can play that role for you. The one thing I mentioned uh, was synchronous and asynchronous support channels. What do you mean by that? Like, so synchronous. And I'll walk through an example of the project that I've been using it on. Mm -hmm. But we've been using Slack channels now. Earlier we were trying to use Gitter. Now we're using Slack. But that has been really helpful in getting users onboarded instantly, where there's a user who doesn't know, like, OK, I have a question. I don't know where to ask or how to ask it. But there's a Slack channel. And people are more communicative when it's like one-on-one. -on -one. They are. It's more easier when they know that I can talk right now versus them having to write like a paragraph explaining what the problem is on GitHub. So these synchronous channels are really helpful in trying to bootstrap your community instantly. Then some, sometimes you may have a lot of noise, which is why you need an asynchronous channel to maintain sort of a history of what's happening. And that could be your mailing list, your developer forums, and your Stack Overflow uh, thing. Could be Reddit, although I have personally not used Reddit that much. But well, the next thing would be, how do you get and build a community? Is yes, you build a good software from work. Go, go to talks, you go out, write research papers, and keep promoting your software to build a community and grow it organically. Join a foundation if, you, if you're ready. It's like the Apache Software Foundation is one that I've been trying to incubate some projects that I've been working on. But there could be more that are, you are comfortable with. So go forward. So I'll give you an example of a few projects that I've been working on. Uh, one of them was Kotlin. Now, going what we know till now, this is what I've learned while developing these projects, was we were trying to develop a web crawler, which was uh, inspired from Apache Nuts, which is where I started, but backed by Spark, and see if it scales. The first thing we did, we started directly from open source. So we then build it in-house and then go out. So it's like the opt-in and opt-out model. We started directly from uh, being on GitHub, being ex having experience with Apache, with a few more commenters. We do to have the licenses ready. We knew how to have the documentation ready. We set up Slack channels. Now we have more than 15 students engaged on this project, which started two years ago. And people, uh, there are some companies in UK that are using this software. And since we have a commercial uh, use case, this project is getting more and more pull requests and more fixes from that person. And the committer from that company has become uh, 
core PMC member. Even though we are not yet in Apache, we want to integrate it, but we are still following the same model. And that has proved to be helpful for a project we just started. There's another project. Uh, it's called Data Driven Discovery of Models. It's a DARPA funded program for four years. And what it aims to do, it's trying to build uh, an auto ML solution, which is do better learning on a lot of pipelines that solve uh, data set. So you may have some, say, Air Force data set or some human genome data set. Just throw it on the machine, let the user, uh, let the system do itself. We'll try out different models and come up with a solution. We were about more than 23 teams across the United States that were funded on this program. We started developing the core APIs of this uh, DCM program internally on GitLab. Once we realized, hey, you know what? We should go open source because we have sklearn, we have OpenML. All of them are trying to do something similar. We open sourced it. It, it was a pain getting all the documentation out, getting all, uh, getting all uh, the issues transferred, all of that. But once you're over that, you have a public viewing that people can see, and then they search. We presented some talks during the next conference and some papers that were submitted. So we got OpenML to uh, have at least a discussion on the pipelining solutions that we were given. So that's how we got engaged with a bigger open source project, just by pushing it and following a similar governance model. One of the last ones, which I would say were, was not maybe that successful, but was a SciSpark project, which was enabling to do like geospatial calculations in a Spark RDD. What is the issue? So we were funded for it. We developed it, put it online, and we didn't have a support mechanism. Once the funding ran out, we, the developers who actually made it did not have time to keep contributing again and to, to SexPart, and we could not gather enough outside contributors who would know and were ready to adopt this technology. So it sort of died out in lack of support for people's use cases. But this is something I would say people here should take care in terms of if you really want to go open source and have a sustainable project, the support channel for your project will be more valuable than the actual number of committers. There has been, uh, I, I will reference a, a paper at the end, which, uh, which is an analysis where I guess about 70% of the issues were resolved by non-committers only users and other developers who were using the software. Uh, I'll probably end my talk now with uh, some acknowledgments of people who helped me uh, throughout my open source journey, and even Lan for organizing this. And I would want us to have a discussion as to if someone has done something in the past with trying to go in open source and experience that it did not work or it did work, something we should probably start a discussion and we can take the notes from here. So, thank you. And this presentation will also be open source available. <laughs> But are you going to see pull requests? Is there a support yeah. channel for that? Yeah. There is no support channel. <laughs> uh, I'm curious as to the uh, uh, what makes uh, if you have any more resources on uh, what making making good documentation for a uh, for an open source project. It seems like there's a good start to a checklist of some things you should have on your yeah. on your slide. But I don't know if you have examples of good documentation for projects and maybe a more extensive. Thing to help somebody actually put that together. Okay, I can point you to that. I mean, it. So, what was the last open source project that you you worked with? Uh, uh, SaltStack. Uh, salt yeah, yeah, okay. I haven't worked with it, but so it's documentation, right? So, what I would say, so have you used Flask? Because the ones that I may have used may not be there. What you have used, but I can try to get some documentation that I personally would like a lot. Flask is one of them. Flask was good for me to, to get used to uh, documentation. There are some, uh, let's say, Apache Spark was good when I started out. 
I don't know what's the state right now because now I'm probably more familiar with just using Spark without reading documentation. But so so that's there, and um, probably D3M. You should have a look at the D3M documentation. We've put a lot of work into that, but it's a little difficult to explain because a lot of the things going in it are machine learning specific, where there's a smaller amount of users who are actually much deep into machine learning, and we are trying to have more probabilistic programming into it, which is also reducing our user base and adaptation. So I'll point you to that. So the one I showed right now was the Apache government, which has worked pretty well for a lot of projects, which you might have heard about. So, and that's what it's all. I mean, you can think that they have uh, very well documented as to what each role should do in uh, the governance model. Yeah. And if you go through that, that should be a good starter for you to do it. So, and yes, I have a bias towards Apache because I've been with Apache. There could be something more better out there. And if people have worked with more models, they should speak up. Yeah. Yeah. They talked a little bit earlier about um, contributor license agreements. And one of the questions I had is, uh, how do you deal with external contributions and redistributing those yeah. where it's not a very clear assignment of ownership? Or, you know, how do you take the contributions in from members of the public and then yeah. deal with uh, intellectual property issues? You know? Well, so which is why choosing a license to your project is the first step you should do. Yeah, but so for example, I have a project that has a three clause BSP license. Right? And, it's, and it's released under that license. But because somebody issues a pull request on GitHub, doesn't necessarily mean that they're assigning me copyright. And so if I redistribute that under the three cause license, yes. I could be creating a problem for myself and my employees. Well, as far as I've read and worked with Apache, the pull requests that come in to that end up being in the same license of the project. So. Say for example with Apache, every every pull request or every piece of code file needs to have the license header on the file. So the user who's submitting the pull request needs to provide the same license header to the product. So one way around that might be to just require license headers on all of the files. And then if they make a pull request that's only one or two lines as a patch, the header is still on yes. the file indicating yes. that it's if, if you look at any probably any Apache project, because we were told to do that when we were doing an Apache. Every file in the code base has a license error. So that solves that issue. And also, the one thing I didn't mention was just apart from documentation, you need to have good contributing guides where you provide a direction of how people can contribute. Similarly, good pull request guides and issue guides, like templates of issues. Like when I'm creating an issue, I have a basic template that comes up and I have to just fill in the blanks. So the developers know that this is the information that I'll at least get from you. What do you find, uh, research-wise, is most effective for growing your community? Research-wise? Or just in, in your personal research or findings, what have you found to be most effective for building your contributor? So, SciSpark, if you take an example, that was a research project that started out. And one thing to increase your community is you give talks outside and promote your software. But the other thing that we failed at, and probably you shouldn't, is support channels. So first thing to get engaged or get users to your project is you need to promote it. Like, yes, if you develop it, unless someone somewhere is searching for a solution which you provide, you may just rely on that search versus you actively engaging in trying to build a community where you go out and you present or join a foundation. For example, like Apache, you, you submit for incubation. Once you submit for incubation, you can go and present your software at the conferences that happen every year. They go to Apache Con and present your software, and then that's how you grow a community of them. 
I mean, you need to actively go out and promote, and you're not just rely on someone landing on your repository. What do you use as your synchronous uh, communication? You will use asynchronous because probably, or use free synchronous, depending on your bandwidth. If, if it's just you who are doing it, then it's it really just depends on your bandwidth and how many resources you have. Because many of the projects might have a commercial backing in the sense that the contributors would be commercially using that software. So they have a vested interest in trying to support that software. Right? If we are trying out, coming out of this research and I'm alone who's doing it, well, one year later, my career path may change. Do I have bandwidth to support that? So it's, it's what works for you, I would say, at the small scale and then going forward. You would build an organic community, which is there on the asynchronous channels. I was the because you are harping on the support community, which I am fully um, on top of. I wanted you to kind of mention more, like how you set up that support channel, like like. <coughs> Walk us through that process of setting up that support channel so that maybe one of your projects who was involved, if they were assigned a role to help support or what was involved in doing that. Okay. I mean, so, well, putting more emphasis on the support channel was actually a tribute to you in this presentation <laughs> because I know you have that thing where you people need to provide good support. And coming from, a, from the developer side, yes, we have a bias to be like, okay, we can go in, see the code, and then resolve the issue. But yes, if, what if you don't want to do that? So, for uh, Sparkler, as an example, to set up, the most help we had was actually from a non-programmer. Well, he saw the project from another perspective, which we couldn't, because we were all always on a screen trying to resolve bugs. But hey, he's, he saw a bigger picture. So. Having a non-programmer involved in your project is probably a good idea so that they can see from the other's perspective as to, hey, I just need to install this and run this. Why are you asking me to go in and change the file and then recompile the code? You don't want that, right? So he had issues. He's like, okay, wait, how would I best solve this issue? And how would I like to be communicated back to? Slack was really popular, getting popular by then. We switched from Gitter to Slack on that uh, software. So that's how we got a Slack channel uh, set up. It was free to sign up for people with uh, any email address, so we did not restrict like that. Once we get a ping on Slack channel, we had active developers during that time because the project was funded, and they would respond and resolve those issues. It, the motivation to help other people was maybe they would have back. Like, you don't, you don't want that expectation, but just the hope that they would come back and contribute so the future uh, issues or support that's required, they would jump in and share the burden of the responsibility of maintaining the software. Which was, it was as simple as that person not being a programmer, being annoyed at installing the software, set up the Slack channel. It was really that. There's nothing magic here. I'm gonna call out Carlos over there, who was posting a bunch of like open source podcasts to our Slack channel. Um, if you want to bring up anything that you learned from that, uh, nothing particularly stands out at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't remember any of the details. I would want. yeah, I don't even remember what I wrote in the Slack channel. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I thought another great reference, I don't know if you're familiar with this book coming out from, uh, uh, Vicky, I forget her name, but the... Brasser. Huh? Brasser? B-R-A-S-S-E-U-R. -S -S -E I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not sure either. She's the, the vice president of the OSI right now. And she's, uh, uh, her book is at least available on Amazon at like the top of next month uh, on contributing to uh, open source uh, uh, contributing open source. So, I mean, you're coming at it from an angle, it sounds like, of like, how do you get your project out? I think she covers that too, but she looks like she's targeting also to get people uh, 
more involved in like all demographics like you know so um, it sounded really interesting and you know being VP of the OSI she might she might be an authority on this right like, so, so that, that that's where most of my information was coming through but uh, I don't remember like I listened to an interview with her but I don't remember even what I was like jotting down in the Slack channel at this point sorry I mean that helps in terms of like if you have a good contributing guide and it's open source for students at least as when I was a student and I was like it was more about uh, bragging rights you can say when you have contributed to open source that shows good on your github profile sort of a thing so that was one of the motivations for me to also start it after I got involved the motivation changed to actually support the project because then I got attached to the project and then not to having those bragging rights well, it looks good it's on the resume incentive. too. Yeah, it's, it's a reputation with intense incentive that you can get. Yeah. It's ten, ten years so, um, Most open source projects, we always seem to struggle with design. Uh, I guess my general question is how do we get designers to contribute? By designers, you mean UI? Like, like, like actual UX. designers, yeah, UX, UI, uh, you know, actual designers to give input and, you know, help design some of this stuff. Because, to be honest, a lot of us are really bad at it. Like, i3 is a great example of a horrible UX experience. Like, here, just edit the source code and, like, rerun it, and then you're a family manager. We have a similar issue on our projects. If anyone has a solution, even I'm looking for <laughs> No one really wants to do UI. People want to do UX, but they don't want to do UI. And forget UX or open source. I mean, that's a long shot. It's the good UIs that you would see probably, that I have seen in open source projects are again commercially backed products. Like coming out of research, coming from the whole development community, yes, UI is a bit lacking. And I am looking at an answer for that myself. I have a, I have a, yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, how do you, um, I forgot the word, but how do you license like images and stuff that you release along with the software, the code itself? I don't know about that. I haven't worked with that part. But maybe. Uh, well, I was going to ask you a question. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you had an answer to this question. Yeah. I mean, this is a discussion, so anyone can answer. Do you usually see by as a pretty popular notion. Creative Commons with a source attribution. Oh, uh, source attribution? That's all you require. You can just save it on your get some reputation and benefits out of it and you get some good images out of it. But I haven't seen a project published like, oh, the code is GPL, but the, the assets are this, and like I have not seen that granularity, but it would make sense. And I don't think Firefox had one of those issues, right, where Ice Weasel came about because the image was not licensed in the same way that the rest of the source did. Mm. And so they couldn't redistribute with the uh, pretty thing, so you had to use Ice Weasel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some that have I know it's a common issue for like, open source games. For games, yeah. I mean. So <laughs> one place that might help you look is if you look at the open glyph icons library and the glyph icons under bootstrap they have licenses for the artwork for some of these open ui icon libraries which are a good place to start if you're looking at open sourcing artwork and uh, artistic content and not just code because they've done it before and they have a license that allows people to download it and use it for Purposes that are almost as expensive as, say, the Apache licenses for software. Awesome. You also had a question? Yes, I did. So, how do you encourage people who have been working on a project that was open sourced, not so much because they really want a community, but because they wanted to check a box on a form to say, yes, we open sourced our software? So, how do you get communities like that to actually embrace the fact that yes they should bring in outside developers yes they should put more e effort into this than just dumping it on a file store somewhere and saying it's there hurry right. well this is <laughs> like this raises one of the fundamental motivations of open source right is your motivation legal or is it social it's like 
Do you just want to be open source because of legal battles or like the checkbox as you just said on a, a form saying, hey, yes, we were as part of this funding, for example, required to be open source, so I have put my software up there. You know, I'm done. It's like that's your motivation, that's your legal motivation, not your social motivation. Right. As a, as a contributor, I have a social motivation because I've also taken the Apache Bill, which is wonderful. Yep. But I work with a lot of people who are really there with kind of a legal motivation of, yeah, we can check a box. So how do we convince them that they need to embrace the social motivation as well? I have, I have a personal answer to that question. Uh, the way you do that is through an example of getting outside contributions that are meaningful to your project. So you take up the promotion towards realizing that those people don't understand that, that you have to go out and promote your software to get contributions, and it takes a lot of promotion before you get actual contributions and some engagement. But once you get that Kickstarter and they see someone actually do something and it's meaningful, then they start to realize that there is this other side that they can get to. And you have to guide them through that process. And it takes a while. It's, it, you, shift your, you shift your contributions from being more of development skills at that level to yet. Well, my role in this project is just to promote it, not to hand it code. And so that's what I've done for projects before. I used to contribute at the development level, and then I started contributing just at the promotion level. And so you got to have that, otherwise you know, it'll not. And typically, those people don't do promotion. So what, at my previous company, they thought like, oh, we'll just open source it, and it, it, magic will happen. <laughs> and, like, and the approach that some of us at the boots on the ground level was like, let it fail. And, it, it worked in the sense of like, it didn't fail, but like, let, the, let that decision fail so that it can see like, because we still need this product, like we still need to keep it working. So they realize that, oh, that's not enough. So for our situation, it worked just to let them, as a learning lesson. You can also add a Hacktoberfest tag once a month if you want to get the contributions. <laughs> So I had two more suggestions for you. One simple in training people to an open source, getting those people to attend an open source conference and seeing very successful open source projects that receive those sort of contributions. Because then they get a glimpse at where they could be. Um, and the other one is more about like issues, making sure you have engaging issues for simple things to be done on your project so that those intro people have an assignment that is easy that is low hanging fruit, doesn't require a lot of background in your project. <laughs> I do remember something since Lan called me out. Thank you. Uh, the uh, one thing that was kind of uh, new to me to that, so I've never been in the governing body of an open source project before, and uh, in in her, the interview with Vicky, they were talking about. Uh, like some of the governance stuff and how to have like clear uh, start and end times to like help address things like uh, burnouts or people feeling overly obligated to things and so that I mean you know burnout being a thing in our industry like that seemed uh, like an important thing she was touching on so yeah. I mean there are certain like as you said a time period for quite a few votes that happen they have like a 48 hour time period or it's like you just if you're not done because you can't really wait and expect everyone to respond at certain point if you have a large enough community. Yes, at that point you having time start and end times really helps in moving forward and not just calling it the Right. Yes. So, the, the other thing I will say is enjoy your project because most projects only have one contributor. <laughs> She also talked about being very open to the drive-by uh, contributors because uh, that that can help keep things moving along too. Because I know some projects don't they want the regular committers, but it's like no, your drive-bys are part of your community too. You have to be acceptable outside, or else it will be dead in like yeah. yeah. drive-by. Drive I mean, yeah, it's like I have a problem with this particular library. I'm going to fix it. I don't necessarily want to get 
in the, the yeah. I, I think drive by is probably very common because you it's a, it's a user. Yeah. This is perfect software except for this one little bug. Yeah. Thanks. And they fix the one little bug and that, that hey, it works. Happy. They just use it. And in that in that case, your so the the committal agreement or your governance body can define how to engage with these people in a way that you don't like scare them away or like shy like they don't have they are not shy then to like approach you or ask you questions. Which is where I found these synchronous channels like Slack to be really helpful. We had students who wanted to commit code to one of like the popular branches and they're like you know what, I'm, this is the first time I'm trying to contribute, but I, I really don't know if my code is good enough, it'll work. So, hey, like she just reached out to me. Personally, we had a chat. I looked at it, told her this is good to go, and then she got her first commit inside. I mean, that's where you're, like, as a committer, you have more social responsibilities of how you want to engage with these drive-by uh, committers or drive-by contributors, so you don't scare them away for the next time when they come. So, so don't belittle them like they're human. Exactly. <laughs> hey, and to that, to the point you're making too, like having that uh, faster feedback, because like you know, I, I'm sure lots of us have a experience like you make a PR and then it sits there for like months before you get a response. I'm like, I've moved on. I don't even remember like what was going like, you know, going yeah. on anymore. Yeah, it might not even match faster. Anymore. Yeah, now it's merge conflicts yeah. and all sorts of stuff. I'm like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Yeah, it's like, and three months later, you are asked to rebase this by someone who just got tired. It's like, no, I don't have time. I'm not doing anything more. Yeah, I don't have that happen. I mean, it's also another experience when you've been contributing to a project, like I've had that, where you've been engaging with people on mailing lists, you have names, you know how they type. So you have this persona that you build for them. And then you go to a conference and you see them live. And they're nothing like that. And then the next time you read their emails in their voice, that's some other experience that I've had. It's like, well, yeah, this guy is Scottish and he would talk like that. I mean, I have that one. There's another thing. Uh, there's a lot of maintainers who are wary about like some of the drive-by committers who submit like module size uh, commits because oftentimes you know you're the one you're the one who's actually going to uh, be managing the code in the future. So it's important to understand what's being committed. That way you know, and, and before you actually commit it, that way you actually know that you can maintain it later. Because if you're just accepting large amounts of code, you don't really know what's going to what's going on. Eventually, you might be disinterested in working on your own project. I worked on one project uh, where the he, I, when I would add a feature, it would not merge it, and it was in there con contribute, uh, how to contribute uh, uh, documentation, and uh, like I had to write the docs for it before it could be merged, and I was just like, fair enough. Well, yeah, that's that's your uh, coding standards or yeah. contributing standards, which also read out those module size drive by contributors who are trying to like. Maybe play your code if you if you will. So, so yeah, this is where I guess sometimes even continuous integration helps. Where so most of our projects that I have started up, we have a limit on the function lines of code you can have in a single function. You go over that, the CI will fail. Your merge request cannot be merged at all. Like a certain like you can use technology to help weed out a little bit of that problem. But yes. If you are not owner of the code and you have to go in and like understand it, yes, that could be a different. It's, it's for the project members to decide how we want to go forward with this. If it's useful, take it in and make it a computer. I mean, that's the other thing. You involve the person in the community so that he's responsible. Just out of curiosity, how many uh, projects are required to develop the stack to make it a test or integration test? How many? Yeah, are, are, you, are you guys seeing projects required that? I'm just kind of curious. But like, can I commit to your side of the you know, small project? Yeah. And, 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 and. So the three projects that we have, you, the one that I mentioned, you will not be able to commit without passing CI. Okay. But that's something I realized we needed uh, after going forward. So like Apache not when, when I started, there was no continuous CI testing for the code that I wrote because 
well, then I had to write tests for my own code. If you don't write it, it fails. So they do run tests on whatever tests were written, but maybe not enforcing coding standards back then. All the, then the project that we started off from scratch, we're trying to enforce the CI, CD standard, which is where these, these softwares that provide free access with an open source license is good. They are really helpful. And GitLab was one of the reasons to go with because they provide the yeah, out of the box. But are you able to implement some kind of uh, this test coverage requirement that you see that pipeline? Uh, someone just does a check in a couple thousand lines of code without any tests? For the site part that you mentioned? Yeah, the, or any, yes, we have a test coverage. Okay. So every time it commits, it checks your code for coding standards and then tells you the test coverage as well. If it works, and then, the, and, then, and then the committer can say that hey, you know what, you need to write that. So actually, I heard a funny story about it. There was a developer who created an open source project, and the project was open source, but he also wanted to make money off of the project. And so what he did was like, he sold commercial licenses of it, but the whole project was open source except for the unit tests, because his his rationality was that. He didn't want somebody to fork his project and then just like then also sell that. So he thought like if he withheld the unit test and integration tests, it, like you could have the code but writing new features like even more difficult because you wouldn't be able to just pull new code and put it in the hard drive and go and it matches everything. So that was his way of trying to compare it. How successful was that? Um, apparently pretty successful because the article I was, he was writing was blog post, he was saying that like, there were some people that tried to fork it and they never took off because of that. Like, I don't know. Um, we have everybody forks, it never takes off. Almost, yeah. almost. Yeah. I mean, it takes passion, right? Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, one of the things that I enjoy that some of the larger projects do, I think more projects are trying to do this, is like, I think um, the, the Document Foundation, the guys that do the Gateway Office, uh, I think Mozilla, uh, a lot of their bug trackers will actually tag bugs that the developers think are like, really important. Well, it's just a one line change. But we just don't have time to deal with it because we're working on bigger issues. But, like, Try to like maintainers who like take the time to write the documentation like how to contribute and show you, hey, like if you want to practice contributing to us, here's some great bugs to start off with because this will get you like your feet wet without having to first mentally map the entire project into your head. So I think that's right now that scares a lot of people from contributing because they're like, well, you know, I want to be a drive by contributor. I'd love to like spend like a couple hours a week on this project, but I'm not going to take the like, six months to like fully. Uh, understand this whole project to contribute to. Trying to find that balance between like you know, spending the time documenting, but also like if you're the sole contributor, I know you don't have all the time to work to do that, but every little bit helps. I think. That was another thing uh, that you had mentioned, like, not just because like not because developers don't have time with everything that they're doing supporting the project, but intentionally leaving them for for its people new to the project so that there is a like pathway. So the intentional job, not just a way to say, uh, damn it. It's called documentation. <laughs> <laughs> you look at me I think, that, I think that goes to encouraging those flyby committers that are new to say that what they've just done adds value if they could document it. Because there's been other people that have, and so hopefully you get one of them along the way to add that nugget. And then I feel good about they've added to the future people. Maybe get that convergence from drive-by to like yeah. container. Because that's what you want, right? You want yeah. conversion. So that would help a lot as like students. And of course, I mean, hey, your science metrics to solve these issues in an open source library. I mean, that overcomes the initial fears that someone might have committing code outside on the large software. Which is a really good idea, I think, of uh, having low-hanging issues to be done. So jumping back onto your note of unit tests, it kind of folds back into this. I've worked on open source projects that have good unit tests and not so good unit tests and some that are kind of in between. I have spent more hours of my time working on commits for projects that don't have good unit tests 
because there's no way to guarantee that it works except sit there for four or five hours and test. So I would stress that on an open source project that you really want those drive-by committers and new people committing to, to maintain a good unit test suite actually makes their development faster because they can sanity check their code without trying to learn every conceivable notion of the project in order to ensure that their code didn't break something else. And then after they write the unit test, you merge that into the private branch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, yeah, in, in general, unit tests are great, right? Because it's yeah. the thing like you know, kickbacks put on the street program. It's, a, it's the thing that the primary thing that gives developers confidence in their code and the, the willingness to refactor. <coughs> you see a thousand unit tests there, you're like, oh, all right, I'll probably change this, and if I break something, those tests are going to catch it. And so, yeah, I was just curious, if, you know, what like, in general, what the open source can do, like some of these projects, how much. I find in my experience that most projects are severely lacking in unit tests because like a lot of projects that I see in open source and in the commercial world, uh, the desire to get stuff delivered overcomes the desire to properly test it and get all of your boxes checked because you can always quote unquote do that later. And I would say that that is a big step towards a major problem with your project if you're not willing to establish unit tests as a baseline. Because like I said, I've made commits that were three lines long and took 10 minutes to make and 10 hours to test. Because there were unit tests that were known to not work. And the recommendation was build with skip tests on every time. Um, <laughs> it didn't work very well. Uh, <laughs> Pilot disabled. you practice it elsewhere, you don't yeah. really learn to use unit tests in your code. That's what it's called, I have to unit test is not just to, to make sure that your code works, but also you become a consumer of your code and you learn how potentially how poorly you've designed your interface. Because you're like, this is hard to use. And you thought it was the greatest design ever. But it takes you know 20 lines of code to do what you really think would only take three. And so then it allows you to redesign your interfaces to a simpler method. There was, there was one paradigm we tried on one of our projects 
I don't know if people have experienced it, they're called behavior-driven testing. Yeah. So it's like you write a story. It, it's similar to user stories, where, but it's like called BDD. It's behavior-driven development. Right, it makes it much easier to plug in a test framework and then build for those specific pipelines. It's very similar to like have a story, have an issue, and then build it. But I found it to be much more smooth in terms of writing it in plain English, which gets converted to sort of code, and then you write your test, and then you do the checkout that people have. Yeah. Okay, so I've worked at a number of companies that claim that you go know, in the direction of EDG. They usually don't even get to the point that doing it makes a perfect fact that So I'm imagining a lot of open source projects are in a similar camp. Well, they, 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 but I, I don't know. Has anybody seen an open source project using BDD that had some traction? I mean, it would be nice if there is. I've just never seen anybody actually do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even we didn't do it for an open source project, but it was like an implementation of that project that we were using. But like, I, I like it. I, I feel like BDD doesn't work because like, like the people who like developers already know how to write, to write a test in a test way, and so like they they don't have the incentive to write the human language part of it, but they don't have the part of it. And so like if in a team where if somebody was writing behaviors that wasn't a programmer, it might work out better. Right? A lot of times, that's not going to happen. But isn't the, the head of the initiative to, to from like the, the user perspective of like the, what's happening? So it might help influence on these. Like, like similar to your interfaces are shitty part of test. Like, so if, the, if you can't describe what you're doing well, like maybe it's not a good uh, user experience either. I, 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 again, I think it would work if the person who was specifying what the product should do was specifying the test, but that's... Oh. That isn't really happening, right? Like, yeah. And that's kind of what BDD is supposed to help bridge, right? Yeah. It's not happening. That's, yeah. that's the point of that happening. That doesn't like, it's never happening anywhere where I work. Yeah. The people driving the product are never engaged. Are not, like, they just, they're like, I want this thing. And then you might get a picture of what that thing is. <laughs> Let's I think someone asked an example of BDD in in usage, I think uh, Cypress CI, which builds a test framework for JavaScript, they're a uh, boilerplate, which I think is called like Kitchen Sink or something. If you like clone that, they have a pretty, pretty nice context like, for for BDD. But that's like their example. It's not like a project. Whatever you want. It's on us. All right, well. Thank you. And speaking of like develop, like developer kind of talking to shop and thinking about theories and unit testing and stuff, um, those of you that were talking about the developer group, is it okay? You guys want to ask three groups that are interested in that? I think we're still hammering out some of the details, but if you're interested in a developer group that would fit under SGV Tech, you can come talk to Carlos or I, but we're still a little bit early, otherwise we would have announced it at the beginning of the year. So it's something that may or may not happen, but is in like pre-pre-stage A planning. If they're super passionate about it, they should come talk to Carlos and I, because we're still spinning dreams right now. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you guys next month. <laughs> 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 um, are we meeting here? You know, next I have no idea what the next meeting is about. Who wants to get up and talk? <laughs> well, there, there is... There, there. Next month or uh, next week? Because there's Connect Week. We talked about that earlier. This month. Right. Next week's this month. Next week's live.
sorry, next month's slug. Next month's slug is what I was talking about because yeah. for the open house, really I'm expecting the members of the subgroup to come up and say, hey, this is what we meet, this is what we do, these are projects we're involved in, come join us. But uh, November, I don't remember what's, when the November it is. I don't think we have any speakers for November or December. So if anyone has any friends, or here, here wants to give a talk. We're always more than welcome. Oh, we also have SoCal Code Cat. Maybe I'm thinking about it for SoCal Code Cat, but I limited on that. But, uh, but I also, that reminded me, like, if anybody's interested in practicing talks, SoCal Code Cat is very uh, friendly to uh, getting people in, up in front of the crowd. What are we talking about? <laughs> Actually, I wanted to mention something. Since we have some members of the San uh, Fernando Valley Love, I finally got to talk to them and understand how their meetings work. So 